Okay, so uh, just to let you know, I've been going through the projects and have graded some of those, still have most of them still left to do. It'll take me through the entirety of this week to grade them all because, uh, as you might expect, they're pretty extensive and I like to fully understand all the stuff that you've done before I scored them. So I'll be grading those as quick as I can and I expect that they'll certainly be graded in uh, at the very latest uh, before your exam. Um, the next thing that you have on your to-do list for this class is homework number 13, um, which is due on Friday the 24th of April. And unlike usual, where the assignments have to be submitted before class, on this uh, last assignment, on homework 13, I'm going to allow you to submit it as late as 11.59 p.m. So uh, the purpose for that is just in case we cover some material in that Friday class that would help you to work on the homework assignment. I wanted to give you some additional time after class to apply that on the homework. So homework 13 due on Friday night. Um, today we're going to talk about the, some topics from chapter 15 in our textbook, uh, the unit method and the cost index. And both of these uh, tie into the idea of trying to predict costs in the future. Until now on the course, uh, usually those sorts of data points have just been given. You know, in a problem statement, I'd tell you what the assumption is for how much things cost in the future, but um, we often have to develop those estimates ourselves, and you've got a little bit of practice on the project with that, but we'll talk more about some techniques today. Before we start talking about cost estimation, are there any questions related to the announcement? All right, well, if not, um, Cost estimates are often used in order to determine um, what features are included in a project. We've discussed budget limits and how you can't put every project into production. And likewise, for any particular project, you may not be able to add all the features that you'd like to. And so two different pictures are shown here, the photo on the left and automatic external defibrillator which is like a public safety device that if someone was having a heart attack in public, you could use that to restart their heart. You've maybe seen them in airports before. They're often put into place in big public buildings. Um, the photo on the right is a picture of a wheelchair lift. And so it's an accessibility measure to try and maybe uh, make a particular entrance a little bit more uh, friendly for those people who are riding in wheelchairs. And so uh, sometimes we use cost estimates of how much things are going to cost in the future to know what features we could get within the budget limit that we have for a particular project. And so it's important that we um, <coughs> be able to predict future prices because it may tell us whether or not a project is feasible and then it will tell us which components can be included. There are some rules that the book introduced. Uh, some ideas on how we should estimate things in the future. And one of those points is that you essentially should use reasonable data. That when you're trying to predict <coughs> how much things in the future may cost, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, the data should be based on a range of conditions that represent what you're actually doing. And an example I like to give of that is if you were going to be building a warehouse in Alaska, you wouldn't use building expenses from Los Angeles because materials cost more in Alaska due to the transportation differences. Uh, insulation and other building requirements are different in Alaska than they are in Los, Ange Los Angeles. And so um, you need to select data that's representative of the location that you'll be working in when you are projecting costs. The second point is that you should use accepted methods for predicting costs. And so there are statistical techniques and there are standardized budget estimation methods that you should be applying. And you shouldn't just uh, make up your own approach or um, speculating on what future costs should be outside of standard techniques. And the third point may be the most important, and that is to uh, keep personal and working relationships separate when making cost estimates. And our textbook introduces the idea that you know, engineers are sometimes put into a potentially precarious ethical position 
when um, material suppliers and um, and contractors may be trying to curry favor with engineers for for example um, if you were designing a a project and you had the ability to choose whether to use plastic pipe in a certain location or whether to use metal pipe so it's up to the, the engineer to decide what's the most efficient solution and what would meet the specifications and what's best for the client and then suddenly maybe one of the suppliers says that they'd like to come in and buy lunch for everybody in the office and give a presentation about the benefits of their materials and no pressure but they just wanted to provide information when really it may be that they're trying to curry favor by providing you know free meals and and there are a lot of professions that struggle with this idea of uh, un maybe unconscious bias or you know downright bribery when it comes to the case of sometimes uh, decision makers would be get invited to go down to Florida or Hawaii for an information seminar but really it's just a paid vacation so we have to avoid all that sort of uh, temptation and make decisions on the basis of what's the most efficient what's best for the client and what's right rather than um, trying to please people who are in a position to reward us so that's some of the fundamentals our textbook talks about with cost estimation and how we generate these guesses of how expensive things will be in the future. Um, here's a picture of a bridge going over a stream and it's a bridge that I studied on a research basis and it's a good illustration for the unit method. Um, a way to figure out how much is it going to cost in order to drill core samples and um, study the rock that's underneath the foundation. So in the research project that I was working on, what we were trying to figure out is this rock that's underneath the abutment of the bridge. We wanted to know how strong is that rock. And the water that's flowing through the stream, how is it scoured away some of the rock that's underneath that abutment? Because you can see it looks like there's a gap between the concrete and the rock and the concrete is supposed to be resting on top of the rock for maximal strength and load capacity for the the cars and trucks that drive over that bridge you need to have a nice strong foundation underneath the bridge but the water can flow along and over dozens and potentially hundreds of years the foundation of that bridge could be threatened and so what we did in this particular project was we called people in a, a drilling company that had a specialized drill that could go down through the pavement and through the concrete and get to the rock that's underneath that foundation. And so we weren't exactly sure how much it would cost for them to do that analysis and so we broke it up into pieces. We broke it up into the pieces of you know how many people would have to be on the job site. What equipment were they going to be using? Uh, you'll notice that there are some orange cones uh, we had to divert the traffic and have safety personnel on site to make sure that the maintenance and protection of the traffic flow um, was adequate. And so there's a lot of different cost components that go into a project like this. Doing a little bit of research would maybe require a trained geological assistant in place to uh, take logs and make recordings of the samples that are taken out from underground and those samples would have to be wrapped in plastic and transported back to the lab and so knowing all of the individual activities that go into the end result which is the end result is you want these rock samples back in a lab in Huntington you have to think through all of the people that are required to make that happen and the, the cost associated with having those people in the field so understanding those costs can be aided by breaking the cost into a couple of different categories. And what we think of as the direct costs are those that you can specifically allocate to a certain work activity. So for example, if you can answer the question, how much of one thing does it cost to make another, then that may be a direct cost. Um, using an example of the Twinkies factory that we were talking about before, you can say, how much sugar is required to make a thousand Twinkies. And so that would mean that sugar is a direct cost because it's specifically tied to a certain level of output. 
So that's a direct cost. And, uh, and examples of common direct costs include the materials associated with generating them, the salary of the uh, hourly laborers, and the production expenses. In contrast, the indirect costs are things that can't be allocated to a specific task. Um, so an indirect cost might be the amount of accounting services required to make a Twinkie. And I mean, when you think about uh, you know pastries, there isn't a, a direct relationship between how much you need to spend on accounting in order to manufacture a pastry. Now we know um, that I mean, at some point, an accountant probably has to be involved to keep track of the revenue and the accounts receivable, and you know we we sort of have a notion that professional services are required to support it, but it's indirectly tied. There isn't a a direct relationship between how much of the input is required to make the output. And so that makes a whole variety of things indirect costs like computer systems, accounting services, the, super, uh, the salaries of supervisors, and so on. So since we can't just directly allocate them, there's usually a, a percentage recovery factor that is applied to get indirect costs. So we'll be going through a couple of methods in the next couple of days to estimate how much it costs to make something. And sometimes when we do a, uh, a list of costs, some of the costs will uh, collect directly and other costs will collect indirectly. Um, our textbook has this figure to illustrate two different ideas of ways that you can generate an estimate of cost. One approach is called the bottom-up approach. And in the bottom-up approach, you are trying to figure out how much you should charge for an item. That's the output of this approach, is the required price. And the way that you arrive at that required price is by starting at the bottom, by looking at the cost of inputs. So you'd look at, for the thing that you're going to be building, what are all of the <coughs> inputs that go into making it? So for example, if you're making iPhones, you'd look at the equipment that's needed to make the iPhone. You'd look at the materials like the RAM and the CPU and the glass and the plastic that goes into making the iPhone and you'd figure up the cost of the labor for example meaning like the uh, the, sal the the hourly pay of the factory workers that are there assembling the iPhone and maintenance and operation to keep the equipment functional so you know calibration and oiling and the upkeep of the equipment and then the indirect costs you'd have to add on top of that because all of these cost component estimates are for those items that are directly related to the output. But then in addition to all of that below, there's also the indirect costs like the, um, well, that, the things that couldn't be directly allocated like marketing. You know, how much, how many TV ads does it take to make an iPhone? Well, none really. And so um, having the advertising expenses could be considered an indirect cost. And so you add up all of the, the money that you're going to spend to generate a certain thing, and then you add a certain factor on top of that for the profit, and then that tells you what you should charge for any particular item. So that's the bottom-up approach, and it works best when you are trying to sell something that's kind of unique. When you don't have that much competition, the bottom-up approach is best because you have the flexibility to set a price just based on how much it's going to cost to make and how much profit you want. But if there is a lot of competition, you may not be able to use the bottom-up approach. Instead, if you're in a market that's saturated with other alternatives and the consumer can just go wherever they want, you may have an idea of what the target cost has to be. So for example, a competitive price for a certain type of thing. Think about a car, a certain category of car. Um, you may know that if you're going to be selling a uh, light duty pickup truck that has four doors, then $50,000 would be a competitive price. Just looking at 
you know, if you're working for Ford and you look at Ram, you look at Chevy, you look at Toyota, and you see what the competitors are charging, so you know for a certain category, if you charge X dollars, then that would make you competitive. So that's starting at the top with what you plan to sell the item for. And then you start breaking it up into, if you're, sell, if you're going to be charging your customers 50000 then where is all that 50000 going to be allocated? So you take a certain amount of that as the profit that you're keeping, a certain amount of that that you're going to put towards the indirect costs and the, all of the costs that go into manufacturing the item. And so instead of arriving at the required price as the end of the analysis, which was the case with bottom up. In top down, you begin with the price that you plan to charge and then you kind of iteratively go through and figure out how much then that means you can budget for each of the inputs that are required to make it. So this is an important uh, distinction and I would again encourage you to read through your book, chapter 15 in your book to reinforce these ideas and understand them in a little bit more detail because we've got an exam coming up soon. Uh, in our book, it also presents this figure. And you already know that I'm a fan of showing a picture on an exam and then asking a student to describe the trend. And so let me tell you the story behind this picture. It's meant to make a point, and it's not like uh, an exact curve that's true in every case, but it represents a general trend or a concept. And what the general trend for this is, is that if you spend just a little bit of time on a cost estimate, let's say that if you only spend 10 minutes developing a cost estimate for a project, you may have quite a bit of inaccuracy. So this is showing that your accuracy is maybe plus or minus 30 percent. If you're trying to figure out how much a building is going to make a building is going to cost to construct, then maybe all you do in a 10 minute estimate is you'd figure out, well, how many square feet is the building and uh, you know how much did a similar building cost on a per square foot basis and then you just project it on that one parameter. That would be considered like a scoping or a feasibility quality of an estimate. But the trend that's illustrated is the longer you spend on the estimate, the more accurate you become. And a detailed estimate that you spend three, three weeks generating, maybe rather than just by going the square feet, in a detailed estimate, maybe you've looked at the level of detail, like how many gallons of paint would be needed in this building, how much sheetrock is required, how much lumber, what kind of lumber, what are the electrical fittings going to look like, you know, how many linear feet of 14 gauge wire is required. So you're going down through all of the details and you're getting separate pricing information for each component. That would take a long time to come up with all of that pricing data. And in the end, your model would be more accurate. You may be getting down to the point where your estimate is within 5% of the final cost, but you have to balance the value of that increased accuracy with how much you spent to improve your estimate. This curve is getting flatter. It's flattening out and what that means is there's diminishing returns. You're spending more and more time working on an, an uh, accurate estimate but it may be at, after three weeks, what if you spent three months on the estimate? Maybe you'd only get an improvement of an additional 1% of accuracy and you know, the dollar value of that improved accuracy may be outweighed by how much you spent to generate the improved estimate. So you're always kind of juggling this idea of you don't want to spend too much time generating an estimate because the value of your accuracy may be outweighed by the cost required to generate that estimate. But that's the trend that's illustrated in the book. Okay, one last figure that I want to describe to you before we get into some practice of cost estimation today. And this is another really important figure. Um, this is showing three trends. And we'll begin with this curve that says potential for life cycle cost savings. The general trend here in the bottom 
is we have in any project two phases, the acquisition phase before an item has been put into service and the operation phase. So it could be that what we're talking about is a computer server. It could be that we're talking about a building or it could be that we're talking about a piece of construction equipment. It could be really anything, but there's this this line right here is when you get it and put it into use. So before that, part of the time you are assessing your needs, part of the time you're doing a preliminary design, then there's the detailed design, production and construction, operation phase, and then finally retirement and disposal. So what this general trend is saying is that your potential for savings decreases as you go through time. That early on, when you're just figuring out your needs assessment, that's the time to make changes to the plan. Because, for example, if you're planning to get a really big building, let's say, for example, that we we're going to replace the, the applied engineering com complex where we have our class meetings, well, it's during the needs assessment that if you say, well, maybe we need 100,000 square feet. If you improve that estimate and you say, actually, we only need 78,000 square feet, then eliminating what's unnecessary will bring down the life cycle cost quite a lot. So you have the biggest, um, the biggest potential for savings early in a project. But once you've actually begun to make commitments about how money is going to be spent, and then later, once you actually spend the money, then your potential for savings decreases. Because at the end of a project's lifespan, when it's not going to be in use anymore and all you're going to do is retire and dispose of that equipment, there's not much you can do to save money because you've already built the item and you've used it over time and so now the only savings that you have is how you're going to be getting rid of it so there just isn't as much potential for savings so that's the first curve the next curve cumulative committed life cycle cost so what this curve is showing is that early in a project you haven't made very many commitments yet about how you're going to spend your money but over time you can see when this is the steepest is during the production phase when you're actually building the item but then once the item is put into service most of your costs have already been incurred you know when you finally have the building uh, constructed maybe you'll spend a little bit more in the future uh, putting in new carpet or operating the utilities and so on but the bulk of the costs occur um, during the acqui acquisition phase. So this is the committed life cycle cost, which is the decision making, putting you on a path towards the money that you're going to spend. And then the cumulative life cycle costs are the actual expenses that you've incurred. So it's not just that you've made the commitment to go a certain route, but now you've actually spent the money itself. So this is another figure that I think is important for you to read more of the accompanying textbook explanation. We just kind of scratched the surface here today of what this means and the uh, supporting text that explains those ideas, but they're important trends. And that is, um, you've probably heard the, the old saying that um, a penny of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I guess it's an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it's, it's easy to do things up front than to allow something to become a problem later on. And so the same thing is true in life cycle costs, that if you can reduce unnecessary expenses early, then that's when you have the biggest potential to save money. Cost savings are the easiest to obtain at the beginning of a project. Okay, so here's a specific technique that we're going to use in today's in-class exercise, and this is built into the homework assignment you've got due at 11.59 p.m. on Friday. Um, the unit method is a way of estimating the overall cost of something by breaking that down into its component units. And so, for example, if you know that you're going to be paving a highway, and you want to know how much should we charge to pave the highway between Barbersville and Huntington. Let's say you're a contractor. 
a highway paving contractor? Well, you'd look at the individual components. You'd look at the components like the uh, square footage of asphalt that's required, the tons of gravel sub-base that are going to be put into place. You'd look at the expense of the steel guardrails on either side of the highway. You'd look at the uh, the um, the earthwork that's required to put the uh, the required slope onto the highway. You'd look at the uh, the grass that's going to have to go on in the medians and so on. So the uh, unit method says that you look at the cost per unit. So U is how much it costs to do per unit thing. So you know what is the cost of one square foot of paving for example. And then you'd multiply it by the number of units required in a certain project. And so some typical ways that the unit method is used is um, you know operating costs for cars can be found on a per square mile <laughs> on a per mile basis. Uh, building a highway on a per mile basis. House construction is sometimes thought of in terms of how many dollars per square foot of construction. And so all of these techniques have been tried and true in the past and ways to apply the unit method. Um, what I emailed you today for the first part of our in-class exercise is the following. So I sent you a PDF via email about an hour and a half ago. Um, if you've got that and you've got it printed out, what we're going to do is go through the calculation of what if you are manufacturing a gas pipeline? So 1,500 sections of a gas pipeline. And what we know is how much we pay for steel on a per ton basis. We know the cost of steel. Uh, and We know how many tons of material are required for each section. We know the machinery and tooling costs on an hourly basis. We know direct labor costs, indirect costs. So this is just a, you know, a basic word type problem where we have some of the components of the costs and we know how much we want to make overall in the project. So I'm going to pause the recording and stop talking here for a few minutes, give you some time to set this up and try and calculate overall what's the um, production costs for the whole pipeline, meaning for all 1,500 sections, how much money is required to get this project done. All right, well, let's look at the uh, solution just to see if you are headed on the right track for this one. <clears throat> Okay, so um, applying the unit method here, we have to first of all look at the cost of the steel. So if it costs uh, $45.90 per ton, and we've got 1,500 sections and two tons per section, that means we're going to need 3,000 tons of steel overall multiplied by $45.90 per ton. So then that means that the uh, the unit cost of the steel will be $137,700. So that's the first part. Now we need to figure out the machinery and tooling costs. So machinery and tooling, it says one hour is required for each section of pipe. And we're doing 1,500 sections. So 1,500 multiplied by 120,000 means that on the machine and tooling, we'll spend $180,000. Okay, now the direct labor is, we've got two components to that, the casting and treating and the finishing and shipping. Now two hours required for each section of the pipe and it is 1,500 sections, so 3,000 hours at $55 an hour means 165,000 would be the cost of the casting and treating and then Finishing and shipping is $45 an hour with 1,200 hours required overall. So $54,000 there. The indirect costs is just going to be $75 an hour and 400 uh, hours on the job. So $30,000 in indirect costs. And then adding it all together in the end, the sum of the costs are going to be Five hundred and sixty-six thousand seven hundred. 
So maybe you've done the unit method before and just didn't realize it, but I mean the essence of this method is you break up a task into subcomponents and then you figure out the cost associated with each of those subcomponents. Any questions on this first in-class exercise? Uh, oops, wrong class. Um, any questions on this first one? The other technique we're going to talk about today is called a cost index. And uh, let me show you an example of what a cost index is. Here is a cost index that shows construction data. And so let's look at this. Take a look at what it's showing us. Okay, now this is a table of data that comes from census.gov. All right, so this is a US government website. And what they're tracking with this is the cost of new single family houses. So uh, in each year, starting in 1964, we've got data here. And what they've done is they've said 2005 is the reference year. So the average cost of a new single family house in 2005, they're saying is 100%. And so it's not that it cost $100. They're just saying that that's the baseline. And so uh, before that, like if you look at 1964, the cost, you know, the house that would cost $100,000 in 2005 would have only cost $12,400 in 1964. So this is a linear scaling that shows you how prices have changed over time. So here's our 2005, and the cost index is 100% of that cost then. Then look at how prices went up after 2005 so they increased a little bit then they went down again there was a uh, the housing crisis that kind of depressed housing prices for a little bit and then they went back up again you know uh, 2019 the average index was 134 so what a tool like this allows you to do is it allows you to take data from one year and project it either into the future or back to the past. So we can think about the house that cost today 134,000 would have cost back in 1976 only 25,200. And of course, it's you you can use this for situations other than a house that costs exactly 134,000. It's just a scaled ratio. And so that's the idea of a cost index and there's lots of different kinds of cost indices. There are uh, cost indexes that uh, look at the cost of consumer items like groceries. There are construction related cost indices. There are some that are related to uh, manufacturing equipment, to labor costs. So just about anything you can think of has a index where they've been tracking the expenses over time. And the way that you use a cost index is with this formula. If you know how much something cost in a prior year, that would be C0. So the C0 is the cost in the prior year. And if you know what the cost index is, both then, which is in the denominator, and today, which is in the numerator, then that would allow you to project what the cost of the item would be in the year in question. So it's a way of taking cost data from previous times and extrapolating them either to the future or to the past. So here's going to be how we test it out and try using it in the in-class exercise for today. We have the case of a, uh, a repair garage which was built in 2004. That's our baseline year where we know the cost. So that was $650,000 is that known cost back in 2004. And the additional information we have in the table is we know back in 2004 um, how much labor costs were, how much material costs were, and equipment costs. And we know of the overall 650000 
what percentage of that was spent on labor, materials, and equipment. All right, so what we are going to take a look at for this in-class exercise is um, what would be a weighted index that we would use. Sorry about that, guys. I apologize. Uh, here I've been going on and on, and the, uh, the sound hasn't been working. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I didn't notice the, uh, the notes typed in earlier. Thank you for letting me know. Boy, that's five minutes. <laughs> that's brutal. Wow. Uh, I wish you'd interjected earlier. You were typing the notes, but I just don't see those off to the side. Sorry about that. Um, huh. So, so you didn't hear me talking about this one, right? Uh, this table is where you didn't have the sound. Okay, well. Um, I'll give you the brief overview. It's basically a way of um, of predicting how much costs would be based on previous data. And so if you knew that a house cost $100,000 back in 2005, for example, then you could look at this data and project what the cost would have been in any previous year. And so a, a cost index is a way of um, a cost index is, is a way of taking data from the past and relating it to other years. And so um, what we're going to do is just to give you an idea of how this cost index can be applied. Um, I emailed you a copy of uh, the in-class exercise for today and um, so here's this situation. We knew that back in 2004 the, uh, the item that this repair garage was $650,000 and we're going to try and predict how much it would cost in a different year. And a table like this a table like this allows you to um, estimate if you know how much something cost in a previous year it would allow you to predict how much it would have cost in a different year so let's say that your construction company is a pretty small company and you only finish a project maybe once every couple of years and so if you knew that you'd built something back in 1991 and now here it is in 2000 and you're trying to figure out how much you should raise your cost estimate, then you'd use a ratio of today's index to the past index in order to predict the cost. Um, so uh, the way that this cost, cost index works is um, we're going to have a weighted index. So in part A, the weighted index is going to be 30% of 175, 20% of 145, 50% of 139. And so let me just, uh, since we already fell a little bit awry when the sound went out. Um, part A says to calculate a, a weighted index. And so the different components, the labor, the materials, the equipment components, they all have a, uh, a different index back in 2004 because you know sometimes prices of one thing will go up over time and st prices could be relatively steady steady for another component um, so in part a what we're doing is we're fighting a winded a weighted index for 2004 and then similarly for 2008 just kind of using the percentages and the index that's given to find a weighted index and so if you're trying to predict how much this item would cost in 2008 from the 2004 data then you'd take the known cost back in 04 so the known cost back then was 650 that's what you know 
was the expense in the past. And then back then, things cost 149 compared to they cost 178 today. And so this ratio, the overall ratio of now versus the past, can be used with the cost data from the past to come up with what the cost should be in today's terms. This is a way of predicting the effects of inflation. This is just another way to, uh, to deal with inflation effects. So that if this is going to be the overall cost, then we could figure out the components individually by then just multiplying the percentages by the total cost, and then you'd find the breakdown of labor, material, and equipment. So that's how you use a cost index. And if we look at the homework assignment just briefly, I think you'll see that there's a couple of problems that are similar to that. And you just take the same approach. Uh, let me bring up the homework assignment. OK, here's the cost estimation homework assignment. And some of it's the unit cost. You can see here I'm doing some problems having to do with the different unit components of a highway paving. Um, and then this is about indexing. So anytime you have an index type problem, then you can use the same approach as this formula. C sub t is you're trying to figure out what the cost would be at year t. Most usually it's the present. And you're basing the cost now on the prior cost, the historical data that you have along with the cost index. So um, you know, back to this idea that there's a lot of different data sources that predict what the, uh, the cost index might be. There's, um, there's the uh, construction data, there is equipment and labor costs, and, uh, and in fact it even goes so far as if you look at what people spend their individual money on, the government has done a consumer price index that is showing like what percentage of the average Americans spending goes towards food, 13 percent. And then they've broken it down by category to find out so of the food spending, how much of it is food spending where the food is going to be consumed at home versus spending on food eaten at restaurants. Boy, there's just so much data here. There's how much spending is on energy expenses, how much does the average American spend on electricity, and what percentage of the spending is on clothing, um, transportation costs and footwear so and so they they have an idea of how much spending is in each of the categories and then they've also tracked how spending has changed over time so this is the consumer price index um, where they've set as the baseline um, let's see what year was it that they said was a hundred looks like around 1984 was the threshold for 100 and so nowadays compared to 1984 prices we're at about 158 so the basket of goods that would have cost you a hundred dollars back in 1984 would cost 258 dollars today so this is an index that is a means of accounting for the effects of inflation and so that's how we can apply it to problem solving. I, I'm really sorry about the audio issue. I apologize for that. Hopefully something like that won't pop up again. Uh, before we go our separate ways I just want to reiterate like what you've got on your plate at this time. As we're winding down the semester this is the last week of instruction so there's not too much more. We're almost through it. Homework 13 is due Friday night just right before midnight and uh, if you have any questions as you're working on that let me know I'd be glad to send you a reply that's it for today I hope you have a, a good one and I'll see you in class on Wednesday